Hi everyone, it's me, that's right, it's Cam, and do you know what really doppels my ganger? No, you're close, it's doppelgangers. I, uh, I find doppelgangers as a, as a creature in 5th edition D&D fascinating for, for a few reasons, but the, the main reason that I'm so interested in them as a, as a creature type is that they're the only one that I know of personally that fundamentally changes the way that the game is played and um, one of the few creatures where kind of every single DM that I know has a different way of dealing with them when they appear in their games. So I guess the idea behind this video was just to sort of share my experience with handling a doppelganger in, in my game and just to see what you think really. The forbidden art of using doppelgangers in Dungeons and Dragons. So I think the first thing that we need to do is have a look at a doppelganger and talk about what they can do. So there's the so there's the obvious thing, right, which is um, they have the ability Shape Changer, which um, I'm just going to read it out verbatim. The doppelganger can use its action to polymorph into a small or medium humanoid that it has seen or back into its true form, which is this kind of weird, creepy alien thing. Its statistics, other than its size, are the same in each form, and any equipment that it is wearing or carrying isn't transformed. It reverts to its true form if it dies. Now, that's interesting, because that's something that I didn't realise, is that its equipment doesn't change. So, like, its clothing doesn't change, which is something that I actually didn't... Huh. Anyway, that in of itself is the kind of thing that, that everyone knows about doppelgangers, right? But the other thing... That is why I feel that this creature in particular changes. Because there are other shapeshifters, right? But the reason why doppelgangers in particular are so compelling is because they have the ability to read thoughts. So um, it's an action. Uh, the doppelganger magically reads the surface, surface? surface thoughts of one creature within 60 feet of it. The effect can penetrate barriers, but three feet of wood or dirt, two feet of stone, two inches of metal, or a thin sheet of lead blocks it. Okay. Um, while the target is in range, the doppelganger can continue reading its thoughts as long as the doppelganger's concentration isn't broken, as if it's concentrating on a spell. Uh, and while reading the target's mind, the doppelganger has advantage on wisdom, insight, and charisma, deception, intimidation, and persuasion checks against the target. So, um, at least in terms of how I run, the, the advantage on checks thing isn't really um, going to be relevant unless it's the doppelganger interacting with another NPC, maybe, but... I don't think I would even I would even do that. I would just assume that all checks pass because that's the kind of thing that you want the players to to realize instead of them. Like, may, I suppose maybe deception checks um, would would work better, but I'd probably just make the DC higher on insight or whatever. Anyway, these two abilities combined, the shape changer and read thoughts, uh, to me, they kind of turn 5th edition D&D on its head. Because um, in, in my experience, 5th edition is, is much more narrative-driven than gameplay-driven. Whereas when you throw a doppelganger into the mix, because of the way these abilities work, they kind of bring the gameplay aspect to the forefront and really change the way that um, that both players and the DM have to think about the game. It's a game first rather than a story, whereas normally it's the other way around. In essence, um, it forces you to metagame. And just for anyone who doesn't know what metagaming is, it's basically using knowledge that you as a player have to influence your character's actions to do things that they might not necessarily do. And the reason why I say this is, is specifically because of that rethought ability. It's not just that they look like you, it's not just that they look like somebody else. It's that they are able to reach into your mind and know what you're expecting that person to do or to say in order to better blend in with whatever group they're trying to infiltrate. And and having, as a DM, you having to basically know what your players' characters are thinking is what drives this kind of upheaval of, of how the game works. And so because of this this kind of interesting interaction with 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 the game itself, um, I think a lot of DMs have kind of come up with different strategies of both introducing a doppelganger into their game. I mean, 
introducing a doppelganger and having having it do its thing within kind of the background of, of whatever adventure you're doing isn't the hard part. The hard part is when your adventuring party and, and your players come into contact with this creature and then have to deal with it. So there are there are various ways that I've heard that people do this. Um, one of them is that you can just have it do its thing and then just have them reveal themselves whenever the moment fits. Um, this The very first doppelganger that most players will come across is probably um, there is one that appears kind of about two thirds of the way into Lost Minds of Fandelver. And uh, that was that was like the first campaign that, that I ran around the table. And um, I was pretty much playing directly from the book. I did very, very minimal prep, minimal to none. And um, as a result of that, you kind of get the um, the initial like, oh, they're just a they're just a poor defenseless person on the floor. Ha ha! I got you. Surprise attack. You know, there's no there's no real build up. It's just like it's immediately obvious that it's that it's a doppelganger, and the the, the tension and and kind of combat situation is is already there. And I and I guess what I what I mean to say by by this example is that the the doppelganger itself doesn't attempt to infiltrate the adventuring party. It will infiltrate groups of NPCs and um and kind of do its thing that way behind the scenes but it will never try and get into that inner circle of your players where it's it's kind of ability to read thoughts or, or whatever um becomes kind of like more prevalent and more complicated i think a a good example of this uh, forgive me if i if this isn't entirely correct it's been a while since i watched it but um there is a doppelganger in kind of the opening arc of the chain of acheron which I think kind of operated on a similar basis to this. And it was a very good and very compelling way of using this kind of more simplified method um, to uh, introduce this um, this plot point without um, getting too wibbly in terms of how it interacted with the players. Then Angel turns to Judge and says, Hail Ajax. Oh, oh, you son of a bitch. Knew it! Knew it! God son damn it! Things really get messy, in my opinion, when you have a doppelganger infiltrate the party. Not just infiltrate the party, but actually masquerade as a member of the party. Um, you Like some DMs will kind of use um, use techniques like pulling people out into other rooms or private discord chats or whatever kind of sending dms or passing notes and all this kind of stuff and i think the moment that you start doing things like that um your players are immediately going to know that something's up especially if it isn't your normal play style i've i've been in games before where kind of note passing and and going into other rooms and and doing all that um is is the norm um it's a very as as far as I understand, it's a kind of more old school style of play where maybe the players are a bit more adversarial than than kind of one hundred percent trying to work together. And it can be cool. I think some players do like the idea of of being part of a of a grander plot and kind of kind of there's when when the DM like pulls you into the side room, there's kind of that moment where they're they're pulling aside the curtain and, and kind of allowing you into their space to be a part of whatever crazy plot they've got weaving. And and yeah, like I I can appreciate that. But to me personally, I do feel like when you start bringing in that stuff, it can be very disruptive to the game flow as a whole. When you've got like it like up to three other players or or more sitting in the other room going like. Dave's been out there for five minutes. What do you think he's up to? Oh, he's probably a doppelganger, isn't he? Oh, not again! So, here's how I did it. Um, I just told them. The party had recently met an elven monk from the same monastery as the, the monk member of our party, Chikisia. Her name was Cassia. And uh, she'd specifically come to the island that they were on with a mission. She was hunting a member of a cult called the Umbral Orchestra and uh, she was well aware of its abilities to kind of supernaturally blend in with whatever um, whatever populace it found itself in. So um, they had traced this creature to um, a group of uh, ne'er-do-well sailors, um, not, really, not really pirates, 
they were just kind of a bunch of assholes that sailed around and made a mess of whatever ports they landed in, giving themselves the nickname the Port Bashers. And uh, she had discovered, or she and the party had discovered that this uh, this character, they never learnt its name, but it was called Warder, had um, had killed one of these these guys and infiltrated their group as part of this larger scheme that's beyond the scope of this video. And uh, so she her, her flaw was that she was quite impetuous. And uh, so while the party was sleeping, she decided, this is, this is my mission. I've dragged them into this. I need to sort this out. So she goes and confronts the port bashers on her own, which led to her being captured, uh, which then led to the party being like, oh, God, okay, right. We better go sort this out. So they go to the to the port basher's ship and the captain is all like, oh, well, you know, mm, we're not just going to let it go. She kind of came in here and started a fight saying that there was some sort of monster that had infiltrated us. That's bullshit. Um, so big fight ensued. Party wins and the, the captain relents. Um, and he was like, right, OK, fine. You can have your friend back. And um, they they return her. And the way that I decided to end that session was foreshadowing the fact that I basically did like a post credit scene, which was in the brig of the ship where um, Cassio was still unconscious, kind of revealing that this thing or this Cassio that was now with the party maybe wasn't all that all that it seemed. To be honest, I kind of... Um, came up with the idea of uh, of having this this mem this cult member being a doppelganger it was sort of a um kind of a last minute decision and it was one that sort of beat me in the ass because i uh, i decided that they were a doppelganger without really reading what its abilities were or or really kind of understanding how it worked so when i was actually like planning that session there was part of me that was like I, I had this moment where I started looking things up and being like, oh God, like how, how am I going to approach this? Because it's very metagamey. And uh, I kind of went through like, oh, well, how would, how would other DMs that I know deal with it? And eventually I was just sat on the tram and I had a brainwave. I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to tell them. I'm just going to tell them. And that's, and that's exactly what that foreshadowing was. And um, before the session after, I I was even I was even more upfront with them and I was like right so um this session that we're going into is going to be a bit weird and the reason why it's weird is because this creature that is now with you you know it's not Cassia but to just be completely transparent this creature is a doppelganger it can read your thoughts and it will use that to try and kind of ingratiate itself even further with you so I'm telling you this now so that it's not like it, it doesn't come as a, as a weird shock when I start asking you what your characters are thinking in a bit more detail and maybe using that to influence the the creature's actions. I just, just I just felt like it would be much simpler and there would be much fewer raised eyebrows and less disruption at the table overall if everyone knew what the situation was out of game and then had the opportunity to resolve it in game. I think this I think I think it worked really well like um everyone was into it and I think they were excited to kind of have this unique aspect play out while um while it not you know causing too much of a of a crazy stir and um everyone played along with it I think that's the one the one um drawback to this method in particular where you as the DM are being fully transparent with your players is you need to be able to trust that everyone that you're playing with is going to play ball and uh, not use that information to um, kind of just just be shitty about it and like do do things that don't make any sense just because they want to be the one that that makes the discovery or, or I don't know things like that or you know um, using the information that you've given them not against you but like to the detriment of the story as a whole. You need to trust that your players aren't going to try to like game you and maybe be like, oh, my character is thinking this, but ah, they weren't really kind of try and do a do a Yugi, a, a Yami Yugi like we've done the mind shuffle. So it is a bit risky. You need to know your players before using something like this. But I do it personally. I think it is maybe 
the best way of approaching this. It's not perfect, but the resulting session was a really enjoyable one um, because there's this kind of meta game tension of like, oh God, I need to tell Cam what my character is thinking. And the moment that I do that, this creature is going to know that. And it, yeah, it just, it's difficult to explain, but it's just like a really um, kind of exciting new way of, uh, of handling role playing, I think. The other thing that um, I would say as well is if you, if you use this method, I don't think um, it, it's, it'll get old fast. You need to kind of reveal it to your players at the start of the session and have the situation be resolved um, or at least at a point where it's not going to be an ongoing thing by the end of the session. They either need to be dead or they need to leave to, to do something. They need to be like ousted in some way so that the story and, and the game can kind of carry on as normal. It's a fun, novel thing to do every once in a while, but kind of get it out there, do it and get rid of it. You know, it's fun for a bit. Don't let it outstay its welcome. And that's kind of all I have to say about that, really. Um, that's that's how I deal with, with doppelgangers in 5th edition, or at least it's how I dealt with it in this one instance. Um, it is probably the way that I will continue to do so on the rare occasion that I decide to chuck one into my games. And uh, yeah, like I would be really interested uh, to see how you deal with doppelgangers in, in your games. Um, I, if you try this out, I'd be interested to know how it goes. Um, let me know what you think. Um, and, you know, as always, you know, thank you for watching. Thank you for your time. Um, I would really appreciate it if you could do all the things that you're expected to, not expected to do, but asked to do to support YouTube people. Like the thing. Subscribe to the thing. Go and do the social medias. I've got a Twitter. That's the only one. I got I do I do Twitch streams. Go and check that out. There's games that happen on there. Do a one-on-one -on -one game with my wife. I haven't introduced a doppelganger in that one. Maybe that'll change. Anyway, <laughs> I'm being dumb. Terrible at ending videos. Thank you all so very much. And uh, the I don't know I don't know when the next video will come out. I've uh, I've sort of piled a bit much onto my plate. I think um, I'm trying to write. An adventure at the moment and, and get it published so that's sort of taking the forefront of, of my time at the moment and then once that's done i'm going to try and get into some sort of regular rotation with uh, with releasing videos but um you know I'll, I'll do what i can when things pop into my mind i'll try and make something entertaining for you guys and maybe maybe just a little bit informative um but yeah uh, again thank you stay safe and i'll see you around those games games Chalky milk. Double games. <laughs>